So, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, again, I'm Brian Earhart, and that's Paul Uleberry back there. And I'm stoked to be able to teach with him and teach all of you some of the stuff that we have taught in the past. We have done clinics together um, numerous times. Uh, one of the things that I really like about teaching with Paul is, and I told a couple of people walking over here, we agree on the same core concepts of disc golf. The fundamentals are the exact same. The way we get there is, I wouldn't say opposite, but pretty it's- Pretty much opposite. <laughs> it's pretty, but pretty far. We communicate the ideas differently. Right. So, so it's actually like a good clinic because we'll communicate one way and it might resonate with certain people and the way I communicate might resonate with other people. So we're gonna cover the backhand, fundamentals of that, distance, accuracy, some things that are mistaught actually um, and cover that and then we'll jump into forehand and then Paul's gonna probably finish up with the putting segment. I have a little mental bit that I wanna do with putting after he's done with that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, go ahead, man. Hit sure. it. Sure, so do you guys wanna do backhand? You said backhand first. Yeah, that's usually what we've done. I, there's so many things that go into the backhand form. So I'd like to kinda of get a feel for what the crowd wants. You guys wanna work on some power, the beginning stuff, the beginning stages, because there's so many intricate little details that go into it from run up to grip to, if I can go over all of that stuff, which will probably take a little longer time than we have, especially if we want to get his side of it as well. <laughs> or, or, right. or, you know, I can just kind of go over like a basic element of the whole entire thing. Basic element, I got one basic element and he's speaking for all of you, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I do. I have a quick question because I've, I've met before Paul jumps into it and I'm so excited about this. How many of you got into disc golf during the COVID lockdown last year? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We have so many new disc golfers coming out year after year, but last year was outrageous. So this is our first year mm. getting to kind of field the new players. So yeah, I, I think it would be a good idea of just, you know, not Perfect. taking anything for granted yeah. and, and getting going with that. The one thing that I teach above all else is timing, right? When you first start playing disc golf, you're going to be all over the place. I was all over the place. He was all over the place. Everybody is like that. Now, when you're younger, you have a better chance of being good right away than you are when you're older and you have bad habits. And that goes back to that thing that I just said, timing, most important thing, right? It's so important to link the feet up to the upper body when you're throwing a shot. Everybody starts off by curling and doing this move and all that stuff. I'm not going to get into that. We're going to start off with the footwork. And we're going to bring it up into the throw, right? We're going to start from the ground up. The number one thing that I teach is getting that timing to something that you've done since you were a little kid, and that's walking and running, right? I could ask every single one of you guys, go take a jog, and you're probably not going to fall down right away because your timing's pretty Hopefully. good. Hopefully. Now, I've seen some, some <laughs> rare cases out there. So the first thing that I'm going to do has nothing to do with the throw. It's linking your throwing arm to the lower body and then making that movement to go forward. And then we'll get into the actual throw and I'll have Brian help me on that. The first thing is when you're walking and running, what are you doing? Everything's opposite, right? I'm going like this and then I'm going like this and the faster my hands go, the faster my feet goes, correct? And that's something that you're taught all the way through any sport that you're ever going to do. If you're running tires, the faster your hands go, the faster you're getting through those tires and your coach is happy. So how we do that is in the X step, what happens is you make one movement with the right foot if you're a right-handed player. And then I say anticipate the back foot then going to behind that foot to make the X step. That's the beginning of all the good stuff, right? I go here. And this one takes weight. As soon as that happens, now I'm moving back. This one takes weight, and then I'm here. That's the fundamental, right? So I take weight. I move behind. Here, weight. Boom, I'm done. Now that we have that, pretty easy, correct? Now we link the arm into it. Because if I do that, and then my arm is up here doing nothing, timing's not going to be right. Because of what? Because... It's not like walking and running. Now this is just my theory, but the people that I taught and my students that I've taught this from the beginning or even professionals who've been doing their form for a long time, this works, okay? I'm going to now link this arm, my right hand, 
my throwing arm up with the movements that my left foot takes. So it's not going to do anything, okay? This one takes weight, nothing happens. As soon as this one takes weight though, I'm going to be moving forward now with this. So it takes weight, I move behind, I stay with this one even in the backswing, and now I'm extended. And then this is the key part, okay? Now we're gonna get into the throwing part of this. We take weight, boom, pumping back, and now these go together, and now we throw. What do you think? I, I think that's pretty good. I think, I, well, <laughs> well, Paul ran through exactly what it should look like. And I want to dive in between the cracks, not saying that he said anything wrong, but explain a couple things. How many of you have watched disc golf videos, and this is beginning to get unraveled in disc golf media, especially like form check pages and video forms, but I've also seen it still discussed incorrectly. How many of you have read through like disc golf forums or watched form videos and heard the word reach back? Ha! I was hoping you were gonna do ah! this right here. So, Thank you. so this is something that we're beginning to see now that we have disc golf equipment that matches a really sound biomechanical movement. Back in the day with the really flippy slow frisbees, you could throw like that and be really good. It's not saying they had bad form. They had to, back in the day, throw like that because the disc needed a lot more spin than speed. Now that we have equipment that says, you can throw this 90 miles an hour, the motion is changing. And it is, back in the day, it was a bit of a reach back because you snapped it. It was very upper body oriented. Not to say again that it wasn't biomechanical. It's now optimizing with this faster, more overstable equipment that we have. The phrase reach back is not a good thing to tell your body, especially nowadays with how far people are throwing it again, the equipment that's coming out. Because what reach back says is that your upper body controls the whole throwing motion. And as we evolve as a sport and as athletes begin to figure out the optimal way of throwing this equipment, it is all legs and hips that are guiding this throw. So the goal nowadays is to not be manually reaching back the disc. A really good first bit of self analysis. And I highly recommend filming yourself at some point, buying maybe a smartphone tripod, something like that. Paul and I have both filmed ourselves for years. I've been playing for 17 years. He's been playing probably longer than that. Um, filming yourself is incredible, especially if you're an athlete. The first thing that you'll see a lot of new players do that are trying to figure out the form is they'll do the X step, but then as this final step's going, whoa, the disc will go way past their back foot. First bit of self-analysis is if at any point in your approach, you see that disc pushing backwards and then traveling past the back foot, you're in a bad spot. This is where what's called strong arming happens. Because what happens is, one, two, push the disc back. Your spine is starting to bend over. What's gonna happen when you plant? Your spine has to correct itself to get back to a standard spot, and then you try to rotate. But by the time you try to rotate to throw, you're too late. And that's where missing the power pocket comes in. You hear power pocket used a lot. And I also, power pocket is a decent bit of imagery. Um, but again, going back, reaching back is not quite hitting the mark. It's good for a beginner just to get the motion, but this is what 100%, and I've studied a lot of these top throwers. Paul actually does it in some of my favorite ways. Drew Gibson is another great example of someone that is almost perfect with it. Eagle McMahon. And I'm using our division because these are people that I have to play against, so I study these players the most. Um, they all do this. Every single one of the best throwers in the world, FPO and MPO. They are here. The disc is usually in a neutral position. Sometimes, if you get more experience, you'll see some pumps happening. That's just a mental timing mechanism. For a new player, try to keep it neutral. Uh, you want to throw hyzer, hold it 
here, flat, hold it here, Annie, hold it here. If we're throwing a little hyzer, this X step looks like this. And again, I'm lefty, so mirror image of all of you. I'm kind of a loser, I guess. Sorry to all the lefties, you're not losers. Here, and then following Paul's walking analogy, we're moving forward together. The spine is neutral, looking good. The extension, again, this is not reach back. I call it an extension. Happens with the upper and lower body. This is how you create that motion, here. This is how this, uh, this point gets reached. And you hear people still teach reach back. And there's actually some really prominent people teaching this still. And it grinds my gears because no one does that anymore. None of the best throwers do that anymore. What you do is you pick your angle, you go one, two, create the extension here. Let me uh, dive into one really bad habit that I see. I'm going to say 80% of the students that I get, they come to me and they're like, okay, I lost all my power. I don't have accuracy, all this stuff, right? And the one thing they're doing is they're doing an X step, right? But their timing goes from being on the back foot like we're teaching, and that timing's now gone to the front foot, which brings that bad habit of having to reach right back into the equation, yes. right? So what they're doing is they're going to move in sync with the right hand and the right foot. And what this does is now that I've done this move, mm -hmm. this has to swing around awkwardly like this. And now I'm facing backwards. And now they're reached here and they have no nothing. And now it's almost like a baseball swing to where they have to go with this and their hand at the same time. That's the biggest bad habit that I have to fix every single time. It's this move here. And you see this, right? It's like a walking thing because that's the way they have to do it. They go, okay, here. And then they throw. There's no power there. All the power is going to come from the hips. All the power is going to come from the ground. The momentum from your starting point to your finishing point has to be with that timing, which is here, load, boom, gone. And a great thing about that is now I can face my target as long as I want. I don't have to turn around with this front foot. I can now walk here and I could face that as long as I as long as I want, which is great for up shots, 100 foot up shots or something like that, to where if you're trying to throw 900 feet, of course you're gonna turn around a little bit to get a little more extension as he mm. calls it, so that you can get that big distance. But I wanted to go over that bad habit because a lot of people can't um, know the betweens of those two. They go, well, I am doing the X step. Mm -hmm. You are doing the X step, but your timing's off. Yeah, D disc is a, is a step early, essentially. Exactly. It's reaching back here, yes. rather than staying locked with that back foot. So, one more bit that I like to teach, that I think is not just for people that have played this sport, it's, it's just something that I think is ingrained in us, and it's what I call baseball player syndrome, or softball player syndrome, same thing. When we're playing baseball, and we're swinging a bat, our feet are here, and this is what you're taught in Little League. Even if you played like one year of Little League, your coach is like, swing the bat like this, and you're like, okay, great. But what's <laughs> being conditioned into your head is that you're stepping even with your back foot. Even with your back foot. And your hips are opening here. This is something that when a really experienced baseball or softball player transition into disc golf, 99% of the baseball softball players that I've done lessons with throw a disc this way as well. And it's actually counterintuitive. So I'll try to show you from this way, going this way, uh, to make it easier to illustrate. A disc golf throw does not stride even with our back foot. A disc golf stride, again, we're doing our X step, goes here. It looks really closed off, but this is the proper motion to brace against that front foot and create that motion, that rotating motion. If a baseball player or softball player gets a disc, a lot of times they'll want to first bring the disc up to where a bat is for them, which again is not the same as having the disc neutral here. And then they'll swing their back foot even with their 
or swing their plant foot even with their front foot. And how does a baseball softball player usually throw a disc initially? Like that. And that's what's called rounding. That's what you see on the internet as rounding. So again, self-analysis. If you film yourself from behind, this is best done from behind. If you see yourself swing that plant foot even with the back foot, you're going to have to guess to throw the disc straight. Because if you're throwing a disc straight based on where your front foot's at, a straight throw would be that way. Very loose rule of thumb. So again, I'll, and I'll do it correctly after this one more time. I'll explain. One, two, and then we throw here. If you threw it correctly with where your front foot was swinging, you would throw that way. That's where a lot of grip locks come from. If you do it correctly, it's going to look like the plant foot is closed off but it's still actually moving in line with your body weight. Your spine is still moving in the right way. So we're here, one, two, three. That's how we reach that position. If we want to throw hyzer, and I guess I'll show you here so y'all can see. Hyzer's here, one, two, three. Because then we can break that back foot into the front foot as we're rotating and actually hit the disc correctly. Baseball you, players, go ahead. Can you explain to them how, you know, a lot of you guys think of reach back because that's what's taught a lot, like you said, on all the forums and even um, probably local coaches and everything, which is, which is wrong because the disc doesn't actually move. Could you hit on that, how the disc, you work your way around the disc exactly. into, into an extension if you're never reaching back? Yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's, that's exactly how you get rid of the baseball player syndrome. Yes. Because the, the upper body, again, like I said, a lot of people try to pull the disc. Uh, a lot of old school players do this just because that's how you threw a disc back in the day. Um, this can be eliminated by literally trying to not think about anything with this disc. Hold it on the line you want. And like he said, drive your lower body in front of it. Once you get it loaded on step two, don't move it. Just think about pushing off that back foot on whatever line you've lined up. So if I want to throw flat, yeah. we hold it flat, we extend flat. Right. Right. Here, and that me, way you're not guessing at the last second. Here, do me a favor and hold this just still right here. Yeah. So check this out. What we mean by this is it starts here. Here, I'll, I'll move this way so it faces oh, yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Starts here. My, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> and as I go, right, watch how this isn't going to move. I'm going to move around it. It stays in the same position the whole time. Yeah. See what I mean? So people think that you need to do this move. If you do that move, it goes off of that line. And then as I'm working forward, yeah. I'm not going to be as consistent. I'm having to pull it off and then on access. I think rule of thumb, if you're too far on your toes or too far on your heels, you're not going to be as balanced. I think for you, if somebody who, if you feel like it's a real problem, like you don't feel balanced being on your toes as much, what was that? I do. I'm a dancer. So like <laughs> then for you, midfoot. Try to plant solid on the ground. Don't tell your brain like heel, heel, heel. I've there's, there's a lot of people that I've worked with that focus too much on that kind of stuff when there's actually some other things that probably could clean up and maybe fix that naturally. Can I take a yeah. second? To, yeah. I have a theory with this and um, to me this is the way that, like he said, the way we teach are complete opposites. I think <laughs> insanely logical about this stuff to where like if I'm going to throw a hyzer, right, then I'm going to have to be on my toe because I'm over the top here. And as I throw, if I'm on a hyzer, it'd be really hard to lift this heel up. If I'm throwing a flat shot, it's going to be hard to go on my toe completely again or on my heel. I'm going to be rotating kind of on the yeah. side of my foot. And then lastly, if I want to throw a roller or a big anhyzer, how am I going to do that on my toe? Right? Yeah. How am I going to go like this? I'm going to naturally go to the heel on a big anhyzer because that's the way that your body really wants to work. So I think um, early on, Thank you. early on in 
the disc golf history, in order to get your big distance, right, you had to throw these massive yep. Anheusers. And that's where I believe they coined the term that you had to be on your heel because and they said the it was big, a law, right? They right, said it was like a law. Because these guys, the people who were throwing the farthest in the world, were throwing these massive Anheuser's. So obviously, everybody's like, "That's the way to do it," because he has the big distance, right? I don't believe that. I believe if you're throwing a Heiser, you're probably going to be on your toes. If you're throwing flat, you're probably going to be a little flatter. And if you're throwing a big Anheuser, you're probably going to be on your heel, just because that's the natural way that I think the body should work. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that I teach a sort of a pump is so that you can down tempo or go faster, right? Now my arm is gonna dictate the movement that I go. If I were to tell somebody to throw a disc right here, just right here, nine feet away, <laughs> I could tell every single one of you to do that and I bet you none of you are gonna be able to do a full X step and then do that without going like this, right? You're like, I did it. I, that's not a full throw to me, right? I want you to do the entire throw. Now what this teaches you, if you're doing the right mechanics, I'm gonna be able to do my entire throw and go through and be able to throw at nine feet. Because now my body's working with itself and I'm able to go in slow motion and down tempo, let go, and my body's like, man, that was easy. But if I'm going fast and that's where this gets all crazy, right? If you're doing the wrong thing, how are you gonna be able to down tempo? It's nearly impossible. So now if I wanna throw 100 feet, I'm gonna let my tempo go 100 feet and then I'm gonna throw. My arm isn't gonna go any faster than that. And this is the cool thing about disc golf is everybody wants to go full power you don't have to do that. If you let your body do the trick and move forward and then not overdo it, you'll actually throw farther than you did before. Like for here, I can go slow and then that's that far, right? Now, if I, I'll give the last example, two same discs. One, I'm gonna do the please don't do. And then the next one, I'm gonna show you the proper way to do it, right? If I go slow, and then I rip it to the naked eye. You're like, okay, dead straight, 200 feet. I'd take that, right? But did you see the energy that it took for me to get it there? You'd probably be like, yeah, but there's something off with this guy. I don't know. <laughs> now, if I have- <laughs> There already is. Yeah. Now, if I have the timing correct, right? And I go slow and then I throw it slow. That goes farther than my arm speed there. I just tried to power it because now my body is actually working with itself and pushing that disc out there instead of me trying to muscle it. So can I piggyback off that? Yes, go. Because I, th I think this is a great question actually because Paul just gave you like the theoretical answer. Like if your timing is right and you, and you like the idea of taking a full approach, all you got to do is tell your brain, oh, 10% slower, everything works together and boom. There's a reason why James Conrad is so good at powering up and powering down on a shot. And it looks like he's not even like stressed ever. It's because he's just pushed himself to get in the habit of throwing an approach on every shot. I've watched him take a full approach on an 80 foot approach shot where literally he could just go like that and, and make it. He just does that and through time, he's subconsciously learned how to up tempo and down tempo. So, it doesn't have to be your skill set, mm -mm. but I would recommend trying a practice round where you take an approach on every single lie that you have. But I'll also give you a realistic answer to also piggyback off of Paul's because that's an amazing way of getting better at the game in general. That feel, that part of the game that you can't really teach, that just comes with trial and error and experience, right? And it'll be healthier for for you than just yeah. powering up and you thinking, okay, I have to muscle this thing. There's a reason why you watch the best players in the world and they and they throw it and you're like, I like to throw way harder than that guy. Yeah. I know it, you know, and then that thing's just gone. Well, but then I'll, I'll, we'll go away from the approach and, and like when you're playing a tournament, what if you want to throw a standstill, you know? Thank you. What happens then? Your question is great Appreciate because this is one of the things that newer players struggle with. They learn all this technique online, 
and then they are faced with a distance that they very comfortably can throw a disc. But they still, you know, they still take their full extension reach back kind of deal and then they throw, right? Everyone has a distance that you can break all the rules of form and play catch. So for you saying 150 feet, we've never seen you throw, but I know that you have a distance that you can tell me whether it's 70 feet, 170 feet, I can just stand here and go like this, right? Over time, that gets longer and longer until you kind of hit that physical peak. Does that make sense? So if you feel comfortable, don't feel like you have to fit your game into a, a series of rules because at the end of the day, we are playing Frisbee, which is feel, you know? So if you have that, choose that. But the biomechanics are best for when you're really having to stay consistent on like a power shot or a very specific shot shape. But there are a lot of things that Paul and some of the best throwers in the world do that you cannot teach. That the body English part of the game, I think, is very under-spoken about. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'll try to, I, I want to hit on something really quick. One, one other thing is when you're talking about distances, one of the things that I teach as well is you don't have to, like he said, have a big reach back. But in order to match that, then your steps have to be smaller as well. So if I'm going to throw to this tree, I'm not going to go like this and then rip it to there, right? Exactly. I'm going to take smaller steps, which are, again, back to that timing to where I go, okay, smaller steps, and I'm going to then throw once this hits because I don't have to get back here. Thank you. And then I go, whew, right? So watch how this throw to that tree won't be a big extension. I just then throw to where I get to, the arm gets to. And now I can be accurate because I'm actually throwing a full shot to there. I'm not having the down tempo from here to that spot. I just go here, throw. Now a little farther, I go throw. If I want the big throw, throw. You see how I'm getting to a certain spot every single time? And that's something that I don't think a lot of people teach because they do teach the standstill. And when you do that, you don't have momentum going forward, so you can kind of just put it there yeah. and then throw. If I'm starting somebody who's never thrown before, I like to teach them the run up from all distances, including yeah. even to this tree, yeah. because then it kind of gets you lined up all the way to that big distance and you want good habits, not the bad ones. If you're having troubles with that, I could imagine that you're doing what I was telling him that people do, which is this, and you're doing more of a stomping thing, right? If your form's good, it takes all the pressure off of all the joints because then your body is kind of working with itself. And by doing this, once I get to here, these have to kind of go together. Sometimes if you're really good, this goes first and then this follows. But if they go at the same time, that's better than your arm going first because now you're putting more pressure on that, right? And then as you do this, this comes in and then it's a natural progression from there. And that's the smoothest as it's gonna get. At the end of the day, you're still doing a high um, contact to the ground sport and that's going to get sore but with the proper footwork and timing that's when we're able to get out of that with the least amount of tension as possible so then yeah last quick thing is is just like I've seen a lot of players and again it's a clinic setting so I haven't gotten to see you throw but there are some players that have really good mechanics but then you'll see them kind of like jam themselves on the tee pad and they'll throw and the disc might look good but that's so much pressure a lot of old, again, old Frisbee players had to really jam their hips to get that disc to have enough spin to even go. Uh, but there's, a, there's another step after that that can release pressure is tell yourself still, throw the disc first. You want to be bracing against that front leg, but then right as you let contact happen and it comes out of your hand, let that back leg swing around. And if you watch, again, on a huge shot, you'll see a lot of people 180 degrees from where they started. On a touch shot, you'll see people kind of here. Um, but if you feel like you're throwing really hard, let that pressure release at the end. But don't do it at the same time. That's that baseball player syndrome, right? So it's make contact first and then let the pressure release. Does make that sure kind of make sense? Make sure this comes in and then you go around. Yeah. 
really bad habit, like he's saying, is, okay, I have to follow through, and now I'm going to go with yeah. it. And then that's, so. that's what, you know, is going to make the form bad. I want to jump into sidearm, and again, I think me and Paul, we teach sidearm a lot quicker than backhand. There's a lot more moving parts in the backhand. Mm -hmm. But I played high-level ultimate for five years, so I've got, I've got a lot of reps with slow, flippy discs, and he's extremely good at the chop forehand, that overstable Raptor forehand. I would honestly choose this guy to get up and down for me from 250 feet out of anybody. So I'll let you kind of hit, yeah. hit your flick spiel, and then I'll go into my, my spiel as well. Mine's pretty easy. You know, I have a lot of people coming to me, and they want the big distance and all that stuff. I don't teach that because I don't really do it, right? I don't have a big sidearm, and I don't really want one, honestly. I like where my sidearm's at. I've worked really hard on it. The one thing that I see when people come to me, they're like, okay, I got a little wobble and I want more power and blah, 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 blah. And then they throw it <laughs> and they, they have a nuke OS or something, you know, and they're just like, oh yeah. Yeah, I pitched. Yeah, <laughs> I got this. And then they throw it and they throw it 400 feet, never stops wobbling the whole time and lands. And I'm like, <laughs> that was nice, you know, but, and then I have to break it down because to me that's bad form and that's bad technique. What I teach, is just like I were to ground up first of all right if I were to teach you how to how to putt on a golf course a traditional golf course I'd be like hey put the ball there and then hit it not okay right you have to learn that touch you have to learn the touch with the putter so the first thing I I'm gonna ask you guys to do if I were to have like a personal lesson with you is I would say get the wobble out of your putter if you can do that then we'll have another lesson so then I have to go into teaching them, how do I get the wobble out of my putter? And they go, okay, and they go, meh. Because why? They're used to that overstable disc and them just hounding it down the fairway. That's not what I teach. The more rotations you put on the disc, the farther that thing's gonna fly. That's just, that's just basic stuff right there, right? And so if I can't put rotations on, that means that I'm getting lost behind here. And then I'm releasing it here, okay, make too sure much power. Them. Sorry, I'm getting here, too much power, and that thing's not going anywhere. So the first thing I teach is spin it and spin the crud out of it. Like, don't just go like, meh, like, spin it. Because I didn't do anything right there, right? And how far did it go? Pretty far, right? I didn't have to go, and then it goes nowhere. Pretty good. Right? Yeah, new go us. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, new personal oh record in front of Yuli. Yeah, pull out your disc. Yeah, yeah, measure that bad boy up. It has nothing to do with it. The sidearm to me is the most technical part of the disc golf game because it's so intricate in the little details that you have to have to be good at it and all angles. And the first part of that is spin. If you can spin it, then it goes. If you can spin it right here, this is tough. Now I'm accurate at this distance. Put spin on the disc, that's the first thing. Next thing I teach, like he said, is that's good for me. It's not necessarily good for power, but once I get in front of myself and I'm putting that spin, now I have a release point. I put pressure here, a stacked two finger grip, you know, classic grip. And what that does is going and beating my hand to impact these two fingers, that's all I'm focused on. I'm focused on getting these two fingers straight to impact and then spinning it. Now the thing that that does is it now gives me a release point, which you can feel when you throw a backhand, right? You can feel that. If you don't have a release or if you can't feel that with a sidearm, you're never gonna have a consistent one. I have a spot right at the end where I can feel that thing go off of my middle finger so now I have a release point. Now I go, oh, okay, now I can start getting into angles. If I go here and I spin it, I know that that release is gonna be here. Now I can do that chop that he's saying, and I can hit those gaps, right? And I'm not even doing anything right there. All I'm doing is getting to my release point, spinning it, and I'm a, getting ahead of my elbow so I'm not going, and this thing's getting in front, and then, blowing out my elbow and all that <laughs> stuff, right? I'm just going, spinning it. Now he gets into the big distance and the big, you know, muscles lifted up, <laughs> getting in the gym. But my big, my, 
my big teaching is you learn to spin a putter, play catch with your buddy. Mm -hmm. You'll soon notice that in order to do that, you're going to have to be slow with it, increase speed, and pop. Now you found your release point, and that's the most important thing in a sidearm game, period, is finding a release point so that you can be consistent from there on out. And then I'll kind of, again, piggybacking off of Paul's thing, I, I, I feel like myself as a disc sport athlete in general, I come from kind of a weird place. Like I started playing disc golf when I was a kid and I learned with chop sidearm. That's all I knew how to throw was like, I think it was right when the Champion Beast came out and I was just chucking this thing on Anheuser and it was flexing out. And that was for a long time all the way I played the game. Then I moved forward and I started playing with Frisbees more and then I started playing Ultimate and then I started coaching Ultimate. So I've gotten a pretty good taste of every stability and speed of disc that you can make. And the hardest thing to teach in the forehand is exactly what Paul was saying, is spinning it. The concept is so unique to any other sport. How do you generate spin, you know, while also getting this thing to go forward on the line that you want? And I found that over time, because of how many thousands of different molds and speeds there are out there. I guess there's only 13 speeds, but there's thousands of molds of those speeds. Um, there's a spectrum of follow through. So Paul's talking about finding his release point and with, the, with those raptors that you were throwing. They'll at the end there. Yeah. yeah. So the overstable stuff, he found his release point out in front of his body. So he lines up and knows that the first 50 feet of that flight, he needs to get that raptor on an Anheuser. So that's how he releases it, right? The way to throw any disc in your bag is to follow this guideline of follow through. The faster and more overstable the disc that you have. The Nuco S is my favorite joke disc to talk about <laughs> as an example. You almost never need a disc that overstable unless you're in the Kansas wind. The faster and more overstable that disc on forehand, the higher and more out in front of you the release needs to be. The slower and more understable the disc is, the lower and farther back in the stance you have to release it. If you see an ultimate player throwing a big forehand huck, they're not throwing the disc out here in front of their body. An ultimate player, especially since they have to step sideways to make that disc go, they are releasing it here. So I'll show you one with, this is a flippy buzz that I have and I'll do it from a straddle. Before I throw this, I'll say, the slower and more under, uh, understable side of the forehand should feel more like you're cracking a whip rather than throwing a ball. So if you want to learn how to flick a putter or a mid-range, envision cracking a whip. You wouldn't go like this if you were cracking a whip. You would go whoosh, like that. It's one of the hardest things to teach when you have a new ultimate player because their whole life they're used to throwing a ball like that, whether it's a sidearm pitch or a football or a softball. Getting them to stop all their momentum feels so counterintuitive. But you want all the momentum generated by this whip motion to go into spinning that slow, understable disc rather than pushing it forward with a bunch of airspeed. That's, that's why a lot of times if you're not very good at flicking a mid or a putter, it'll flip over for you instantly. You're putting so much air speed up against the disc with not enough spin to keep it stable. So as you're on the low end of the spectrum of the follow through, understable and slow, cracking a whip. And as you get to the faster stuff, it's more like throwing a ball. So let me show you the far end of the spectrum. This is a flippy crystal, flippy crystal buzz. And I'll just go straight from a straddle stance just to show you what Paul's talking about when it comes to spinning it. And I'll get you another buzz to go a little straighter. Here's another buzz. I'm releasing it here. Whereas Paul releasing the Raptor out here. So I'll take on the other end of the spectrum. This is a hilarious run of machete 
<laughs> I highly recommend not throwing this in most situations unless it's really windy or you need a skip shot. I'm not saying it's a bad disc, great disc, but it shouldn't be your workhorse. It, sh it should be your trick shot disc. So I'm gonna again, my release point as a lefty is gonna be higher and more out in front of my body because I need to get this nose down. If I release it too far back in my stance, it's gonna go nose up and instantly fade out. And the other thing with the driver a lot of players struggle with is they have the driver, they have the release point, they're good, 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 and then last second before they're about to release, their upper body falls back or they dip. And boom, nose up, stalls out. The faster, more overstable the disc, the more you get it out in front of your body, and just like a pitch, you're letting your body come through on it. Let that upper body come through on it. So my release point's out here. Yeah, it's not, it's pretty overstable. <laughs> but again, d does that spectrum kind of make sense of the follow through? So when you're playing catch with somebody and they give you their favorite, you know, ultra star or whatever catch disc they have, if you feel it and you're like, oh, this doesn't feel very overstable at all. Literally, if you need to even pinch your elbow at your side and just go pop, that's how you throw those toy Frisbees. Very, very soft cracking of a whip. With the neutral stuff that Paul likes to throw, this is an onyx. It's kind of in between. You want to get enough speed against it to keep it stable and enough spin to make sure it's flying. If you put too much airspeed, it flips over, not enough, it's fading out. I'll try to show you here with this onyx. Nice and flat, maybe a little Anheuser out of the release. Heads up. So, you don't have to be a master of the sidearm in regards to throwing every disc in your bag. Uh, I've found starting tour as a sidearm player, it's tough to sustain if you're playing a lot of disc golf. So if you are a sidearm dominant player, please warm up. Please warm up a lot. I've had a lot of shoulder injuries over time and I've had to shift to being more of an all backhand player because I failed at doing that early on in my life. So please stretch, please do little band workouts to warm yourself up. Uh, the sidearm is pretty violent. <laughs> so if you are an all sidearm player, I've seen people do it for a long time. Sarah Hokum is a phenomenal example of that, but stay in good condition. And if you don't think that you look like Brian when you're throwing it, if you feel like you're overpowering it, you probably are, so you need to slow it down. The reason that he's able to do those things is because, again, I like to teach to be smooth, the timing and everything, right? Because now he's making his body work with itself and he's getting the maximum effort out of that. That didn't look like it hurt, right? He just kind of threw it and then it just went. And we're all like, dang, like that's kind of nice, right? That's what we all need to work towards because if you're not looking like that, then you're definitely doing it wrong. I, I, I think I have my stretch band here and I can show you what I've been doing. So, first off, disc golf strong, Seth, knows these injuries all too well, has a platform with a ton of exercises if you wanna just look up that library. The stuff that I've done after all this time that I like to do, I like to engage. A lot of people, if they, they uh, tell me they have pain, it's coming from the posterior shoulder. And the easy way to hit that is taking a stretch band and doing the no money stretch or the no, no money workout. So you're holding here, keep your ribs down, and just extend the band. You'll feel it in your lats and your posterior shoulder. And then I do just regular band pull-aparts. And again, I'm not a personal trainer here. After all this time, these are the ones that make me feel like I'm, I'm warmed up the most. So I do a bunch of these. I also like to do rows. So I'll wrap this around a tree and I'll pull backwards like this. Again, hitting my posterior. And then another one that you can do is the lawn mower. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come here, buddy. <laughs> it's, it's just here. Uh, and, and honestly, I, I stretch every day. I stretch every morning. Um, and I, I do resistance band stuff every single day. Um, I've had a lot of shoulder pain. And, and these, just getting the muscles ready to take impact 
is enough to really mitigate a lot of those issues. Um, and that's an, another reason why I don't like to try to get more power yeah. is because then I do feel that impact going to my shoulder. And when I keep those fingers in front and I spin it, I don't feel any pain. And I've been playing for 17 years, 15 years on tour, 40 tournaments a year averaging. And I'm, I've never had pain with the sidearm, right? So I know that that kind of works. And I've seen players, so many players in that time frame that came out sidearm dominant. I don't know where they are right now. And that's because, you know, that big power comes at a cost. There's a reason why pitchers don't last that long, you know, in the MLB. Some do. Some have great form, but it's big impact on that shoulder, big impact on your whole body. So this is something, it's actually a really interesting question. And there's a reason we don't spend as much time on sidearm as we do on backhand. Backhand is just, it's more figured out, per se, biomechanically, as of right now in the game. And we've seen a lot of people, especially the best sidearm players, all seem to have a little bit different footwork. Whereas with the backhand, all their footwork looks pretty much identical. So I'll show you what I do. I kind of do a bit of a shuffle step. I don't do like a full X step here. For me, it feels like my toe of my back foot is kind of like clicking the heel of my front foot. Um, so it's, who's that wonderful gentleman? Hit him. Okay. Oh, I mean, I mean, uh, watch out for that guy. So you, do you want me to walk, <laughs> just walk through mine? Yeah, just walk sure. And this is just for kind of a snapped flat shot. Come here, boy. And the other thing is with the footwork, a big ticket item that all the best sidearm players do. You know, obviously Sexton does his little hop and you have a few people that kind of like almost face their body. Like Albert Tam looks like he's charging the T-pad. Their weight is moving wherever that first 50 to 100 feet of the flight is going to start. So if I'm throwing a little flex with a driver, which for me as a lefty is a little left to right, I'm gonna move my body right to left a little bit because I want to hit that line first and then let the disc do the work afterwards. Does that kind of make sense as well? So a little flex out of the hand, hopefully they don't hit you here. I'm gonna move my body a little bit right to left just so I can hit that first 50 to 100 feet. Nice. So I, I wish I could give you like, this is correct. Yeah. This is the best footwork, but I've seen so many people do footwork with the sidearm so differently that I think the core thing that I can teach with that is if it feels natural, it's probably good and make sure you're moving your weight in the direction you want that initial flight to, to be going. If you know exactly what you need to be doing, like I need to get that elbow off my body and engage that, Start from a standstill, literally. And I know it's a silly answer, but if you know the message you want to send to your body, because and it's like if I could take, you know, give you a lesson, I could see exactly what you're saying. But to give you a self-diagnosis, even if you're sitting here and you're going like a hundred feet, if you're if sometimes you feel like it's pinned to your side, just stand here and just only focus on upper body. Sit here and just go, okay. Elbow off the side, it's not going to touch my body. And just sit here and just rep that and tell yourself that message. Doesn't matter where the disc goes, it's more about getting that message sent to your body. Because again, like you just told me exactly what you, you wanted to do. So I've had a lot of practice sessions like that because back in the day I used to reach back for my backhand and I would really get myself out of whack. So it took me about a year straight of going to the field, filming myself with a smartphone tripod, and saying, my only success is coming from when I look like I'm doing it right. Um, and again, the sidearm is not this perfect, there's no golf robot to tell us what a perfect sidearm looks like. But if it doesn't hurt, and you're feeling like your brain is telling your body what to do and you're executing it, that's what you want to be working on. Does that make sense? 
another important thing as well is just like in the backhand where you're using your feet is like he said there's a lot of different run-ups but really the at the end of the day they're all kind of getting to the same position yeah. really and that position is whether you're doing a shuffle step or whatever the position's going to be here on this going forward right so then load and then get off that back foot because just like in you know you teaching baseball or how to hit something hard you see those pitchers are loading and then that's where you're going to get your power and that's your body helping you go forward again the reason he's able to throw it so far is because that's so ingrained and it just works together with that timing to where if i'm not going to load on this and then i'm just going to go all arm my shoulder is going to have to be the big muscle taking that hit not this mm -hmm. and so that's what he's saying get on this and then we can pop it forward right there off of that bad boy. All right, let's go into this putting stroke though. Um, I get really excited to do this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, few things, the basic things that uh, you're gonna need a little spin when you're putting. You're gonna need to get into your stance. But over time in my career, I've learned the most important thing when it comes to putting is your release point because that's where the disc is going to go. I see so many people obsessing about their stance and their positioning and spinning it or pushing it or their finger position. That, all that is just doesn't matter to me, okay? Because I can do a little twirly bird down here and then if I come up and I open my hand where I want to, what's gonna happen? That thing's gonna go in the basket. So before anything happens, before a stance or anything, what I would suggest doing, if you want a really good putt, is to do this. However you grip it, you know, I don't care, but go. This far away. That is now your release point, and that is the most important thing in your putting stroke. I've done a lot of clinics, and it's changed over the years, but it's all worked up to this one thing, I believe, and getting to your one release point. Since I've done that this year, I am currently the number one putter in the circle on tour on UDISC, right? 90%. And that's because, thank you, though, that's a big accomplishment. Over the years, I haven't been that. And what I've done is I've simplified it. I go, okay. I literally started from scratch and I started doing this. I went to three feet and I went, how, why can't I do this from there? It's that simple. It's because we get so lost and okay, I got to rock back, rock forward, don't break my wrist, do all these rules. But when it comes down to it, if I just lift up, I bring it to the same spot and I lift to the same spot and then I release, that's a putting stroke. You slow down Paul, I think Paul Macbeth, has you know the classic stroke, something that's been consistent for a very, very long time. And what he does so good is he brings it to the same spot and then he lifts up and he opens his hand. Now that's tough for, pardon me, I had a little fly go into the, <laughs> into the vision there. The old eye hole. Yeah, huh? okay. <laughs> um, a lot of different strokes are a little bit more complicated because of grips and different things like that. Right, so a push putt, your release is actually going to end up opening up lower than what I'm trying to teach you. So it actually is tougher to get a release point with like a push putt or something. Like I'm opening up a little bit lower. That's why I don't like to teach that. So if you guys want to get a push putting lesson, go to somebody else. I'm done. Put, I'm done teaching. I think it's extremely difficult. And I actually do it from deep just because in the circle is what I want to teach you guys. That is where you're going to save the most strokes. If I were to tell you guys all to get in a line and I put you guys at 20 feet, I know you guys are going to miss that bad boy. A lot of you, a lot of you are going to do that. And that just should never happen. From this distance, it should be automatic because you come down, you lift up, and that should be on the stripe every time. It's it really is, right? And that's because we're not, we're not practicing that. Once you get good from here, this is as easy as it becomes. Move to here. And if you can do it from here, take one more step back. And as soon as you can't make that every time, 
Don't move outside of that distance. Do not do it because you haven't earned the right to. Okay? If you can do it from here, then you move back. Then you move back. Then you move back. Right? When I putt now, I'll go to 20 feet if I make them all. Then I earn the right to move out. Otherwise, I just make those 20 footers and I stay there until I got that dialed. And if I, if I can't make it from there, I go to four steps. And sometimes I look really, really stupid because I'm sitting here like this. <laughs> you get what I mean? I'm going right here. Come on. That's how easy it is. And it's not, it's not just about, you know, Paul's saying it's not just about putting it in the basket. The funny thing about the disc golf basket is I can close my eyes and do this and throw it in the basket and make it. Doesn't mean it's a good putt. He's talking about your green light of success doing what he's saying comes from not just going in the basket. It has to come out of your hand and you have to be honest with yourself and say, yep, that was exactly what I wanted. Yes. Correct. I take the basket away sometimes and then I'll putt and I'll visualize a stroke just so that there's no end result because that doesn't matter. You know, this is another thing that I teach. I know my form and I'll miss putts in a tournament, right? I'll miss a putt in a tournament and I'll be like, I don't care. That's exactly what I wanted to do. The result doesn't matter. I finished my stroke. I got to my spot, my personal spot. That's a made putt, right? Even if the wind lifts it and you hit the top, that's still a made putt. I would take confidence from that and I go to the next hole and I make another good stroke. Putting, everybody thinks is difficult because that's the way that disc golf has taught it over the years as being difficult. It is not, I'm here to tell you, putting is the easiest thing to do in disc golf. It's tricking your mind into saying that and how do you do that? From right here. Can you guys do this? How many, if I said, okay, I'll give you a thousand dollars to go like this, open your hand, hold your hand up. Okay. Now move back. I'll give you another thousand dollars. By the time we were done, a few guys would have like $10,000, I bet. No disc in your hand. If I just was like, okay, do this. Stop. Good. People get the disc, they put it in their hand and then they think they turn into Paul McBeth and they're like, oh yeah, look at me go. <laughs> Here it is, Whew, the no, no chance, right? Because they don't have a form dial. They get it going and they think they have to put a certain amount of power so then their hand gets going and it does all this other crazy stuff that has nothing to do with making it in the basket. And that's just going from here, here, open, done. You know, this is a, a putting clinic with Brian and Paul and I do things way different than anybody else, right? I wish I could be like Ricky and have the same stroke from here that I do out there or like Paul McBeth feet, yeah. or whatever, right? I don't, I'm Paul Euliberry. So I have that same problem. And over the years, I'm like, okay, I can't make the same stroke, why? And then I just stopped doing that stroke because I'm not gonna just beat a dead horse. You know what I mean? And so now from deep, my stroke looks nothing like mine in the circle. Cause I don't want to mess with my in the circle when I know that I can get to my mm -hmm. spot. Now I have a different stroke from here because exactly what you're saying, I know I can finally get it there. From this, with the stroke that I have in the circle, if it's not working and you're doing that, if I'm going, okay, down here and I lift up and I have a release point and I miss, we're done with that, right? Make a new stroke, get the, this to there, find the new release point, rinse, repeat as far as you want to go. Lately, I've been able to make putts from 100 feet. I've never been able to do that in my life because I gave up on this thing where my stroke had to be the exact same everywhere. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with you figuring out how to get it to the basket and then getting consistent at that. Trial and error, I get to, I get to a certain spot and if I feel uncomfortable, then I'll do something else. I, I, got, I got real sick of getting to that place and not feeling confident and now I just if I feel like I need to do a different stroke sometimes my disc comes out on an angle like this and I make my Anheuser putt at some distances but that's because I'm not going to release a putt ever again in my life unless I'm going to think I'm going to make it right and I felt that pressure at different spots so I just created a new putt you know yeah and that's trial that's a lot of trial and error but what it comes down to is if I can do it, this is like gold information for all of you guys because now you can do it. You know what I mean? There shouldn't be a point where you're doing your same stroke and you're like, well, why can't I get it there? 
you know? Well, if it's not getting there and you've tried really, really hard to do that for a long time and you put up a thousand putts or you put up 500 putts, this isn't something that like, I was just like, okay, I, I tried it. No, you can ask Brian, I put up tens of thousands of putts at this distance and it didn't work. And so I was just like, all right, I'm good. And I tried something else. Oh, I'm up. You're up. <laughs> Give me your I putters. I hope that helped. <laughs> hey, I don't know why I have. Thank you all so much for coming out. Good luck if you are playing. <laughs>